Where are the Marxists here? I don't know any. I don't. Who, who is a Marxist here? All right. So last week I attended a debate between Jordan Peterson and Slavoj Žižek titled Happiness, Capitalism versus Marxism. I've already done one video on it focused on Jordan Peterson's idea of self-improvement and Zizek's critique of that. Now, in this video, I want to go uh, a little deeper on a, a few different issues. So first, let me um, show you this clip of Zizek discussing PC culture, because I think this is actually this showcases Zizek's ability to speak, potentially speak to Peterson's audience. Yes, we should carry our burden, accept the suffering that goes with it. But a danger lurks here, that of a subtle reversal. Don't fall in love, that's my position, with your suffering. Never presume that your suffering is in itself a proof of your authenticity. Please, if you are a leftist, don't feel obliged to be politically correct. Think, think, don't be afraid, don't be afraid to think. And uh, especially, would you agree, one great version of not thinking is how immediately, if they don't agree with you, you are labeled a fascist. But that's the laziness. People find something they don't agree with instead of thinking, they think about something we all agree was a bad thing, Up, you are a fascist, and so on. You know, it's not as simple as that. Even Trump, of whom I'm deeply critical, no, I'm sorry to tell you, yes, he is a catastrophe in the long term and so on, but he is not a fascist. You make it all too easy to play these games. I just want not a positive result, but to shatter you a little bit. All right, so I wanted to show you that clip because I think it gives you an idea of how Zizek is able to reach Peterson's followers by having a very similar critique of PC culture that Jordan Peterson has. So I think it's good that, that Zizek... Uh, led with that and also ended with that and um it does miss one thing though and this is something that because look i don't see this as i don't see it as a huge issue because i don't really see it like for example the sasha baron cohen character in his uh, showtime show where he's this self-hating white male who wears <laughs> his professor who wears an npr shirt and in one of the clips in uh, from that show he is talking to uh, a, a black man and the black man calls himself black and then Sasha Baron Cohen's character says, no, don't say that. That's very offensive to call yourself black. Like that, <laughs> that kind of thing doesn't really exist in real life. That's mostly like a, an internet phenomenon if people like that exist at all. But the, the kind of thing where Zizek brings up how um, uh, don't do the thing where if people disagree with you, you call them a fascist. Yeah, that, that does exist for sure on the left. But a similar thing also exists on the right. Jordan Peterson. I mean, when people disagree with him, oh, they're they're postmodern neo-Marxists, or they just see a they have a critique of what you're saying, and they're not postmodern neo-Marxists, as you're going to see later on in the clip. Zizek asks Peterson, "Where are these Marxists? I don't see them." So, anyways, I want to I'll I'll get to that, but the point being here, Zizek has the ability to reach Peterson's supporters with a similar critique of culture that Peterson has, and. Uh, let me get to the next clip here where Peterson discusses his view of hierarchies and how he believes they're they're natural and also how, in his own words here, hierarchies are not predicated on power. Watch. The idea that one of the driving forces between history is hierarchical struggle is absolutely true. But the idea that that's actually history is not true because it's deeper than history it's biology itself because organisms of all sorts organize themselves into hierarchies and one of the problems with hierarchies is that they tend to arrange themselves into a winner take all situation and so and that, that is implicit in some sense in marx marx's thinking because of course marx believed that in a capitalist society capital would accumulate in the hands of fewer and fewer people and that actually is in keeping with the nature of hierarchical organizations now the problem with that isn't so much the fact of the, so there's the there's accuracy in the accusation that that is a f eternal form of 
motivation for struggle, but it's an underestimation of the seriousness of the problem because it attributes it to the structure of human societies rather than the deeper reality of the existence of hierarchical structures per se, which as they also characterize the animal kingdom to a large degree are clearly not only human constructions. It is the case that hierarchies dispossess people, and that's a big problem. That's the fundamental problem of inequality. But it's also the case that hierarchies happen to be a very efficient way of distributing resources. And it's finally the case that human hierarchies are not fundamentally predicated on power. And I would say the biological, anthropological data on that are crystal clear. You don't rise to a position of authority that's reliable in a human society primarily by exploiting other people. It's a very unstable means of obtaining power. So, so that's a problem. Well, the people that laugh might do it that way. All right. Now, this was the moment where I think Jordan Peterson is clearly wrong. And I'm going to have another video to show you that actually somebody who probably should have debated Peterson on capitalism. Uh, Richard Wolff, I'll have a, a clip of him coming up, but let me first get to the, the hierarchy thing. So, okay, he says, you know, hierarchies are natural, they're, they're in nature. Okay, fine, but they evolve. I mean, our system evolves. There were hunter-gatherers, then there, were, there was feudalism, then there's capitalism. These systems all change and evolve, and they change based on the needs of the society and what works, what doesn't. Everything evolves. So this idea that they are permanent or they shouldn't be critiqued because, well, that's hierarchy is just the way it is. Capitalism is the way it is because of hierarchies. No. Critique the system. Understand what is broken in the system. Understand or, or what is rigged in the system and how it can be improved. So... I don't really have an issue with Peterson saying that, uh, oh, hierarchies are natural. Okay, what, whatever. I have an issue with him just using that as a reason to not critique the system at all. It's sort of weird. So it's like, so th there's actually this great, um, this great article in Current Affairs by Benjamin uh, Studebaker, and he uh, writes this. Imagine if, instead of winding down feudalism and abolishing it in, the, in 1660, the British made the kinds of arguments Peterson made in this debate. They might have pointed out that feudalism made Britain richer than it had ever been before, that urban living can be a grim and can be grim and brutal, that going to work in factories would rip families and communities apart. And besides, don't we care about other things aside from economics? What about God and the church? Didn't St. Augustine tell us to reject the city of man? Peterson celebrates a system his own arguments would have defeated. As we stare down the barrel of climate change, anxious and afraid, alone and isolated, perhaps some of us wish it had been so. So this is like, if you put Jordan Peterson back in time, he would be defending the system that we have evolved out of. Or even if you put him back, I, I made this point in the other video, if you put Peterson in, in, the, in the early 1900s, he would make the point of, oh, women shouldn't have the right to vote because we have this hierarchy. It's, it's worked for us so far. Why change it? I mean, it, it's just a really weird perspective to have. It's okay to, to see hierarchies in nature. But it doesn't make any sense to use that as the the basis to not critique how the system currently operates. Now, this is what I really want to get to, though. So, Peterson says, human hierarchies are not predicated on power. And he also says, quote, you don't rise to a position of authority that's reliable in a human society primarily by exploiting other people. And that was followed by laughter in the audience. So, let me show you who... If we're going to have a debate about Marxism and, and capitalism, who Jordan Peterson probably should have debated on this issue, and that's Marxian economist Richard Wolff. So here's Richard Wolff discussing this issue of how the system actually functions and, yes, how it exploits people. And I wanted you to also just counter another argument that I hear constantly. I earned it. You know, we earned this money. The best way to describe this is to do, to go back to Karl Marx and his analysis of capitalism so that we all understand what earning is about. Let's imagine you are a person looking for a job and I'm the employer that you're looking to get hired by. So we, uh, you come in and you sit down, you fill out your application form and I look at you and I describe to you the kind of work we'd like to have you do. You'll come on nine to five, Monday to Friday, and you'll sit over there and you'll do this kind of work, et cetera, et cetera. 
And we get through all that, and you're, you're okay with that. And then we get to that big question, how much are you going to get paid? And let's say we, we, we dicker back and forth, and we agree on $20 an hour. So I'm going to pay you $20 an hour. At this point, Marx enters with a smile on his face and says, I'm now going to show you, the reader of his books, that when that deal is done, the $20 an hour, something is going on that you actually know, but you don't want to face, but I'm going to show it to you. When the employer, when I hire you for 20 bucks an hour, I know that for every hour that you give me your work, your brains, your muscles to work, I'm going to have more stuff to sell at the end of the day because you're added to my workforce. You're going to help me produce more goods or more services or better quality goods and services than I would have if I didn't employ you. So I'm going to say to myself, hmm, it costs me to get Abby $20 an hour. What do I get out of it? I want, I'm going to have the output that Abby adds by her labor. Now that has got to be more than 20 bucks. So the only way I'm going to hire you for $20 an hour is if you produce more in the hour than I give you. So when you feel in a vague way at the end of the day as you walk home that you're being ripped off, you're absolutely right or in Marx's language, exploited. So what does the capitalist say? I earned it. No, you didn't. He just ripped people off. The way most corporations work is four times a year, they take the profits they've made in the preceding three months, and they distribute a portion of them to their shareholders. These distributions are called dividends. So if you own a lot of shares, say because you inherited them from your grandma, or you stole money and bought them on the stock market. There are lots of ways of getting them. But if you have them, four times a year, you go to your mailbox in the morning and you get an envelope and you tear it open and inside is a check for your share of the profits that have been distributed to shareholders. For rich people, this is millions of dollars. They have all that money. What did they do exactly to earn that money? Nothing. Those people are going to tell me they earned? Earned what? Did they ever set foot in the factory? No. Do they have any idea what this company does? No. They don't care. They are simply sitting there collecting. Well, let's now do a little logic. If there are people like shareholders who get a lot of goods and services they didn't help produce, then there must be elsewhere in that system people who produce what they do not get. So that means, if we allow that, that we are saying, some people, your job is to produce a lot more than you get so that these people can get a lot more than they produce. For Marx, he stands up and says, I rest my case. This system sucks. Yeah, so I think that's pretty clear. The only reason why we haven't really questioned it is because we haven't really had people like Richard Wolff it, mainstreamed enough to be able to question it on a level where most people are seeing the analysis, are seeing the critique. So I think it's clear that capitalism is based on exploitation. Now, you may say, okay, yes, it is, but that's the way things are. It's worked out for us, whatever. Okay, fine. Have that. <laughs> you can make that argument if you want. But to deny the fact that it is clearly based on the exploitation of workers, I think, is to just be ignorant of how the system operates. Now, let me get to the next clip here where um, Zizek discusses or <laughs> asks the question, uh, and Peterson answers, where are these Marxists that you're talking about? You designate your, under quotation marks, I'm not characterizing here, enemy, or what you are fighting against, as sometimes you call it uh, postmodern neo-Marxism. I know what you mean, all this, from political correctness yes. to these excesses of whatever uh, uh, spirit of envy and so on and so on. Do you think they are really, where did you find this data? I don't know them. I would ask you here, give me some names or whatever. Where are the Marxists here? I don't know any. I don't, who, who is a Marxist here? They are already the one who is not a Marxist, but at least approaches economic topic, Bernie Sanders. He is already under attack as white male and all that stuff and so on. Who are, give me some names and so on, and who are these 
postmodern egalitarian neo marxist and where do you see any kind even of, of marxism i see in it mostly an an impotent an utterly impotent moralization please i'm so sorry that i was no no that's that's no problem please. well i mean um organization like jonathan heights um uh, what's it called heterodox academy and other organizations like that have documented an absolute dearth of conservative voices in the social sciences and the humanities, and about 25%, according to the, uh, what I think are reliable surveys, approximately 25% of social scientists in the U.S. identify themselves as Marxists. And so there's that. But where are the well, results? Well, okay, but, but let, can well, you name me one? Uh, the, I know a couple of Marxists. For example, uh, uh, who does very solid economic work, although yeah, I don't totally, uh, David Harvey, one. But he writes very serious books of economic analysis and so on and so on. Then there is the old guy who is far from simplification, Frederick Jameson and so on, but they are totally marginalized today. In this politically correct mainstream, you know, I, I don't see. Well, yeah, your question seemed to me to focus more on the the peculiar relationship that I've noticed and that people have disputed between postmodernism and, and neo-Marxism. And I see the connection between the postmodernist types and the Marxists as a sleight of hand that replaced the notion of the oppression of the proletariat by the bourgeoisie as the oppression by one identity group by another. All right. I think Peterson completely exposed himself here. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's conflating people that are, in his mind, obsessed with identity politics. He's conflating those people with Marxists. How does that make any sense? It doesn't. That's why Zizek asks him, where are these Marxists? Can you name me one? Name me one. And he couldn't name one. Because they are not mainstreamed. They do not exist. Go on CNN, go on MSNBC, read, read the major papers, the, 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 the big websites. Is there a Marxist on any of these panels, on these networks, or writing any of these articles in these big papers? No, because they are completely, as Zizek says, they are completely marginalized. But Peterson is using the term Marxism as a way to describe people that are, uh, I guess, obsessed in his mind with identity politics, which, by the way is also an issue on the right when you have the Republican Party and their supporters 95% white. How is that not identity politics? But because Peterson is white, he is not able to see outside of himself and understand that, oh, yeah, this is also a problem on the right where the right is completely obsessed with white identity politics. So this is... And by the way, it all depends... Like, I don't want to get into the whole discussion, but there is a way to discuss identity politics without it being this issue where people freak out about it. The way identity politics should be viewed is that we can speak to issues that affect different groups and address all of those issues within one, for example, one uh, campaign for president. So the issue of whether it's uh, housing discrimination or police brutality or food deserts, issues that affect certain people, or issues around trans rights. There are ways to discuss identity politics and understand that it is really, it, it, it's really just a way to discuss various issues facing different kinds of people and be able to address those issues. That's all it really is. But the way that it can be conflated or, or the way that it can be, um, I guess, discussed... Yeah, I guess it can go too far if you're someone, like I mentioned, the uh, the, the Sasha Baron Cohen character where he's a self-hating white man. I mean, yeah, it can go too far in that sense. But in this case, it's clear that Jordan Peterson has essentially created a term to describe people that are not actually Marxists.